Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to worship tonight. I invite you to stand as we begin and face the entering light of Christ. Jesus Christ, you are the light. Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. Stay with us now, for it is evening. Let your light scatter the darkness. May God be with you all. Let us sing our thanks to God. Blessed are you, creator of the universe. From old you have led your people by night and day. May the light of your Christ make our darkness bright, for your word and your presence are the light of our pathways, and you are the light and life of all creation. an offering to you. O God, I call to you, come to me now. O hear my voice when I cry to you. Let my prayers rise up.
may our prayers come before you, O God, as incense. And may your presence surround and fill us, so that in union with all creation, we might sing your praise and your love in our lives. Amen. A reading from Luke. Two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with Jesus. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching, but the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Truly I tell you today, You will be with me in paradise. The word of the Lord. Friends in Christ, grace and peace to you from God, Trinity of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. It may feel a little early in Lent to hear this story. But as I was thinking about promise, which we've been talking about throughout Holy Week, this text came to mind as one that is worth us exploring. We have Jesus crucified between two criminals. And these criminals represent the ways that people respond to Jesus. We have the one who mocks him, derides him, and only kind of ironically and unknowingly gives him his actual title of Messiah. And yet then there's the other who recognizes who Jesus is, at least on some level. And Jesus makes no response to the one that mocks him. But to the other, who we often call the penitent thief, to him Jesus makes a promise. Truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. It's worth noting, just kind of incidentally there, that there are no commas in the original text. And so there's some disagreement as to whether that is truly I tell you today you will be with me in paradise, or truly I tell you today you will be with me in paradise. I tend to go along with that latter one since Jesus himself did not go to paradise that day. But the when of this thief being promised paradise doesn't matter, doesn't change the magnitude of what this man is given. And this is a story that we love to tell about Jesus. It's one of the most well-known ones. And yet, really, if we think about it, and if we're honest, this story in some ways offends us. Or it would if it weren't enshrined in Scripture. This man beside Jesus, is a self-admitted sinner. He himself says that he deserves his sentence of death. And so we have these three little sentences tacked on at the end of his life, and that's enough? Can you really have a deathbed conversion? People have asked me that a number of times, you know, really, at the end of your life, you can just say, I believe, Jesus, forgive me, and that's enough? Does it count after a life of sin, even maybe unrepentant sin? 
As much as we like to talk about grace, we really want to be able to cooperate with it. We want some of it to be able to be our effort. The idea that salvation is entirely grace, entirely a free gift, without at least a little work on our part, on human beings' part, can be really tough for us to accept, to really wrap our minds around. I mean, how often do people say that they are sure that someone is in heaven because they were a good person, they lived a good life? Or how often do we say that being Christian, being a Christian, is largely about being a good person? We're often pretty sure, or at least hopeful, that living right gives us a better shot at salvation than people who don't, who choose not to. If asking for forgiveness at the last minute is enough, well, then how is that fair, right, to all of the people who spend their whole lives, and many of us might count ourselves among them, trying to do the right thing, trying to be good, or if not their whole lives, at least some part of it more than the last minute. The story at its base is not fair, and that offends us. And we don't even know if this man's repentance was real. He doesn't actually say he feels sorry for what he did. He just admits that he's a sinner. And he has some recognition that Jesus can give him the help that he wants. And so there's this plea for help when Jesus comes into his kingdom, whatever that might mean. And yet Jesus chooses to offer him everything, or not even offer. He just promises it to him. The power here rests entirely with Jesus. When he speaks salvation to this man, and not only to him, it becomes reality. We see that earlier in the Gospel of Luke with the story of Zacchaeus. When Jesus announces today, salvation has come to this house. And then he adds, for the Son of Man came to seek out and save the lost. He lavishes on this thief more than the man asks for, and something he can never earn, not in any way. This comes right after Jesus had even thrown forgiveness over all of the people there who were his murderers, his torturers. This is the God that we have to do with. Lent can sometimes be a time of mighty striving, right? We choose our disciplines, our fasts, our prayers, and we work really hard at keeping them perhaps more than at any other time of year. And if we are successful, we might feel especially holy, that in this holy time, we are doing what is required of us, maybe even going above and beyond. Or if we are not successful, if we have not kept to the promises we made, if we never got around to making our promise of a discipline, or we have broken what we promised, we may feel especially sinful in this time, especially hopeless, that we couldn't do what we had meant to do. And so it's important for us in this time to hear this promise, which is for us, too. And this promise, it takes away before it gives. It takes away our self-reliance, our sense of being better than anyone else, takes away our control over our own salvation. What we do amounts to nothing. It is entirely Jesus to give to whomever he chooses. But what the promise then gives us is far greater than what it takes away. It gives us assurance of Jesus' power, his love, his mercy, to grant life to hopeless, good-as-dead sinners which, like it or not, is what we are. Jesus came to seek out and to save the lost. 
And so we are never unstable, never beyond the reach of God's love. All we need, all it takes, is Jesus' promise. We trust it, trust him. And we can close our eyes at the end of the day or at the end of our life, knowing that it is enough. The light shines in the darkness. An angel went from God to a town called Nazareth to a woman whose name was Mary. The angel said to her, Rejoice, O highly favored, for God is with you. You shall bear a child, and his name shall be Jesus, the chosen one of God most high. And Mary said, I am the servant of my God. I live to do your will. in love in peace in peace we pray to you O 
your peace and salvation we pray to you. For peace between nations, for peace between peoples. For us who are gathered to worship and praise you. For all of your servants who live out your gospel. For all those who govern that justice might guide them. For all those who labor in service to others. Grant weather that nourishes all of creation. Keep watch on our loved ones and keep us from danger. For all the beloved who rests in your mercy. Help us, comfort us all of your ways. Great and merciful God, source and ground of all goodness and life, give to your people the peace that passes all understanding and the will to live your gospel of mercy and justice through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. God, remember us in your love and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Come to the banquet, for all is now ready.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us bless our God. May Christ Peter bless us and keep us. May Christ be ever light for our lives. May the spirit of love be our guide and path for all our days, our days. The peace of Christ be with you all. Let's share a sign of Christ's peace with one another tonight. 